Yes! Let there be light. That is what the Lord said, and he saw that it was good. Friends, thank you so much for joining us this morning. My name is Jason Cho, and it's my honor to be one of the... (laughs) Thank you. It's my honor to be one of the pastors here at New Life Covenant Church. We're continuing our Love God and Love People series this morning, and when I kicked off this series a few weeks ago, I made the case that God is love, and his love is meant to flow through us so that we can love and serve others. I also asked you to consider whether God has your yes, your yes to do things his way, and your yes to loving people the way he loves people. Last week, Pastor Tim spoke on getting low and being humble of heart and how that's a winning strategy for life. I personally know God can't have your total, complete, and absolute yes without humility. True love requires humility because humility allows us to serve, whereas pride seeks to be served. And when we serve in love, we cannot help but look like Jesus Today, I'm going to share about how my yes to God became an intersection where loving God and loving people came together in a powerful way to serve one person, my former foster son. The title for today's message is Love Above All. This morning, I'm going to give you a glimpse of the journey my wife and I have been on over the past few years through our experience as foster parents and some of the lessons we have learned along the way. And just a special note about my amazing wife, Angela. She is one of God's greatest gifts to me because she continues to inspire me, challenge me, and invite me to grow in the things of God, even beyond what I think I am capable of. So if you're married, look to your spouse and tell them you married up. Some of you are just saying, I know. (laughs) You're welcome. And that'd be fair too. (laughs) You know that deal. (laughs) And if you're not married, but would like to be married, please raise your hand and one of our ushers will get your contact information (laughs) and get you connected to someone for who might be marriage material. Don't you love being part of a full service church? (laughs) Some of you are like, we should go invite people to this church. (laughs) Finally, someone's doing something. (laughs) So my family and I, uh, we have been proud Wichitans for a few years now. After my family was called to Wichita, we were excited to start this new chapter of our lives. But to be perfectly honest, we weren't fully sure what this chapter of our life would look like. How many of you know that when God calls you to something, oftentimes he doesn't give you all the details up front? (laughs) Yes, thank you, Lord. We trust you. For us, this was about us moving forward in faith because within six months of living here, God presented Angela and I with an opportunity that would forever mark and change our lives. And the chance was to foster one of her students. Now, fostering was never really on my radar. And especially in this season, I mean, God had literally just called us to move halfway across the country and we had four little children in tow, it was not great timing. And yet God had placed my amazing wife at a special day school where she was the credit recovery teacher, uh, helping teens with emotional and developmental challenges get caught up in their schoolwork so that they could graduate. And from the beginning, God had kind of put one student in particular on her heart that she had identified. And she didn't know what that meant, so she was praying for him, she was believing for him, but again, she didn't have all the details up front. She just knew that there was something special about him. Then, uh, one Monday evening when I was out of town, I called to check in with my wife because that's what good husbands do when they're out of town. And I could sense a little heaviness in her voice. And I just asked her what was going on. And she shared that the heaviness in her heart was because that same student was getting emergency disrupted, which meant he was in the foster care system and going to be quickly removed from his current home placement. And she just didn't know where he was going to end up, but neither did he. 
And as a good husband, I sympathized with her and I told her that I would pray. And she grew silent. She grew silent with a deafening silence that only a wife can produce. I was like, hello? <laughs> you still there? And then she said, well, I had something else in mind. What if we fostered him? And I wish this is the part of the story where I could tell you I was noble. And I said, yes, if that's what the Lord has, we should absolutely do that. But the reality is I actually had a lot of different thoughts that were swirling around in my head. Questions started coming. I could feel my blood pressure <laughs> rising and I was beginning to sweat. I was asking questions like, would we really be bringing a stranger into our home? Would it be safe for our other kids, for us even? Would it end up putting a strain on our marriage and God forbid if something bad happened, would I actually end up resenting my wife for creating this situation? Could we even afford to bring him in how would we make it work? We only had one car at the time and we had four car seats for our littles. Where would he sit? How could we even like go anywhere? And we were already so busy. What margin would we have to care for this young man? You have to understand our oldest child, Ellis was born in 2019. And then our second, Brielle was born in 2020. And then we were surprised with twins in 2021. And then God called us to move to Wichita. Don't try to make plans. This is just a little advice. It, it does not matter. Like he'll let you, but it just won't work out that way. <laughs> and I was thinking, were we really going to add to our family already having four children, three years old and younger, mind you, while we are in a new city? I asked her, how long did we have to make this decision? And she said, a week. And I nearly dropped the phone. Of course we had a week to make a life-altering decision for our entire family. It was hard. And it is a process that God led us through because by Thursday, I felt something shift all these questions I had, all these fears, all these concerns, they felt different. And I asked her, I said, babe, are you okay? Like truly okay if the answer is no. Because I needed to know that she didn't have something unhealthy in her heart or she was trying to force a result or she was carrying some kind of like savior complex. And she said, it would be hard but I would get there. And then I told her, well, if that's the case, then my answer is yes. Because I needed to affirm that this was a decision we were making together, that it wouldn't just be hers, it would be ours. And I knew that there wasn't enough time for this to make sense in my head, but it already made sense in my heart because in my heart, I knew I was surrendered to the things of God, that everything I had was God's. My children, their safety, our home, our finances, our marriage, my very being, I had surrendered to God long ago. And if you wanna know how to get to that place of surrender, actually last summer, I had a chance to speak about my testimony a little bit. There's two videos on YouTube you can watch, and I promise you they'll be a little surprising. <laughs> and I returned to that place of surrender where I stopped trying to rationalize it in my head because sometimes when God calls you to things, it, don't, it just doesn't make sense. It doesn't add up in your head. Our faith is not intellectual. Our faith is a relationship. So, as my wife and I were talking, I knew that there was very little we could actually commit to. So I said, the only way we go ahead is focusing on this one thing. And the one thing 
is that we will love him every day like Jesus because everything else we cannot promise and we do not know. <clears throat> so on the Monday before Thanksgiving two years ago, we welcomed a new 17-year-old foster son into our family. And now we had five kids in four years. And I can say, friends, it is not a contest or a competition. <laughs> do not feel like you have to grow your family that quickly. <laughs> As we told our littles that he was coming to live with us, I remember Ellis at the time saying, I love him already. And it was beautiful, but I was so convicted because that wasn't my response. But that's the first thing. Maybe she's the pastor. And isn't this why we need to be like children to enter the kingdom of heaven? Because it's just so clear to kids. So over the course of 10 months, I got a front row seat to see this incredible young man who felt far from incredible. I got to see what the foster care system produces. And I got to see him carry the weight of this. And his story is not unlike many other kids who are in the foster care system because this is a young man who, as a child, had parents who were struggling with substance abuse and addiction. In fact, his entire family lived three hours away in eastern Kansas, and he was here isolated and alone. For five years, he was in the system. And his family was splintered the moment he got separated from his parents. He lived in about 30 different homes over those five years, which is insane to think about because that's like moving every two months on average. <clears throat> he had huge walls and barriers where he couldn't let anyone in. After all, why should he? He was broken in ways he couldn't even recognize. And if you don't recognize your own brokenness, I promise you, you won't be able to find your own healing. Everyone in his life had let him down and he lived in this normalized dysfunction. It was more surviving than living, I would say. But when he came to live with us, it must have seemed so strange. Having family dinners together, going to the zoo, going on vacation with us, being encouraged, being called higher, and being loved were all foreign to him. And it freaked him out. And I imagine God's love freaks us out too. It feels so strange to be loved by the God of the universe to whom we have nothing to offer except our own huge walls and barriers, our own brokenness. And yet he chooses us first before we could ever choose him. And God is so much of a better father than I am because God is not debating on whether or not he should include you into his family. He's already chosen you and he continues to choose you. And I understand that love can be uncomfortable and can cause us to run. And that's exactly what he did one Tuesday night. He went for a walk and he actually just kept walking. And normally when he'd go for a walk, because we live out west towards Goddard, there's literally nothing around us. He just kept walking and Leanne Bennington saw him walking down Maple and texted Angela and said, is he supposed to be out here? And she said, no. And Angela promptly called me and we dropped everything to go look for him. And we found him at the Dillons at 135th and Maple. We asked him to come home so we could talk, but he refused. So we just walked with him and we tried to understand what was happening. And as we were walking, I asked him, I said, are you running away? He said, I don't know, I guess so. I said, did something happen? 
Like, did we do something? I said, no. I said, is this a decision you might regret? He said, yes. I said, then why are you doing it? He said, I don't know. On and on it went like this for two hours. We walked around the building. We walked around the parking lot, walked across the street. We walked down to the neighborhood and back. It was clear he was trying to get rid of us, but there was no escaping us because we were pursuing him and there was no way we would leave without him. And I think of Jesus' love for us, how he pursues us, how the Father's love pursues us. I tried calling his caseworker. She didn't pick up. We tried calling the foster agency hotline. No one picked up. We called his therapist. He picked up, so we put him on speakerphone, and he was trying to de-escalate the situation, but to no avail. And then I thought, well, now I'll just start calling church people. Someone who can actually do something about this situation. So I call David Howard, who is an officer with Witch PD, and he has worked a lot with foster runaways. And I said, Howie, what are we supposed to do? And he said, well, if he's not a danger to himself or others, you should keep walking and talking. And I said, Howie, that's so easy for you to say. You're at home in your jammy jams. I'm out here on the mean streets right now, trying to be Jesus to people. And then Howie began to explain to me that if we called the cops, they would come, they would pick him up, but they'd take him to an unsecured facility where he could just run off again. And then we'd literally have no idea where he was. So it was better at least that we knew where he was and were with him. And Howie told me he'd pray for us. And I thought that was nice. So then I hung up the phone and I called Pastor Tim. And Pastor Tim also dropped everything to come be with us and this little posse started growing and we just walked and talked like endlessly walking for hours trying to have a conversation but he wasn't willing to engage and then he went inside the Dillons and went into the restroom and I followed him in because I was genuinely scared. I didn't know what was happening or what he would do, so I went in. And he locked the door to the stall, and he just sat there. So I just sat on the floor of that restroom. I didn't know what else to do, so I just shared things that I knew were true, even if they didn't feel true to him. I told him that we loved him and that it was a joy for him to be a part of our lives and a part of our family. And that if there was anything we had done to upset him, that we apologize. I told him to come home. I told him that we didn't regret a single part of anything. Even this moment, we did not regret And after an hour, when Dylan's was closing, we left and he got in the car with a promise that we would honor his wishes forever for whatever he wanted to do in the morning. And the morning came and Ange and I were absolutely a wreck. We were exhausted, we were bewildered, we were frustrated, this felt like the end. And to make matters worse, in the morning, he wouldn't talk or respond or even get out of bed. And I'm like, oh, this isn't done yet. This is just round two. Again, I called everyone we knew to call and no one had any answers. And then finally I got to this point where I just said, hey, it's clear you don't wanna live with us. So let me just start helping you pack. 
I got a tub, started putting things in the tub, and then I felt the Holy Spirit say, or you could stay. Just stay. And then I felt the Holy Spirit put something on my heart to get down on a knee and get eye level with him as his face was against the mattress. And through tears, I said, I am begging you, please stay. And through his own tears, he finally relented and he said, I'll stay. In that moment, I felt the Holy Spirit so powerfully, his presence, because I knew, I just saw, literally saw that God is the only one who can change a heart. And God is the only one who can heal his hurts. I was also overwhelmed by the way God loves us. You see, having our own four biological children taught me a lot about God's love. But it's kind of easier to love our biological kids because they look like us. Because Ange grew them in her womb and delivered them. We were there from the beginning. It was cleaner and easier to love them. But having a foster son taught me something very different about God's love. The reckless love, the overwhelming love, the love that won't quit because it can't quit any more than God can stop being a father. And I wonder how many of us live in this place where we are testing God's love. You know, after this whole episode, I actually talked to one of my friends who was a social worker for a decade. And she told me, oh, good, you passed the first test. I said, what test? He was testing you to see if your love was real. He wanted to see if you would cut him loose like everyone else in his life had. And I said, if only I had known there was a test like this. I could have prepared. I'm Asian. We do really good on tests. I just need to know that it's coming. But I did not know it was coming. So it was more like a pop quiz. And I was sweating it like any good Asian student would. And I do wonder how many of us test God's love to see if his love is real how we push and push to see if his love has any limits, if the father has any breaking points when we've just done too much, so much, he can't handle it anymore. But I promise you, friends, the father's love knows no limits and knows no bounds because he has already demonstrated for you how much he loves you in the son, Jesus Christ. And for all these challenges we faced while fostering, there was so much beauty and so much to celebrate and thank God for. Yes, there were hard times, but there were also amazing times. We saw God move literal mountains in his life. We saw miracle after miracle. He got a job he didn't deserve with a wage that was way beyond his skill level. He graduated when he didn't want to because Angela wouldn't let him give up on his future. He got a truck at a steep discount and was living out one of his dreams. And each miracle was proof that our yes was making a difference in his life, but this wasn't just about our yes. There was a big yes from this church supporting us. There were times we relied on this church to take him to work. When he graduated, it was this church who showed up in full force. Nearly 30 people from this church at his graduation filling the front two rows of the auditorium. To celebrate a young man who probably had never been celebrated in his entire life. He bought the truck from business owners at this church who were willing to lose money on the deal because sometimes there are things more important than money. 
He served alongside beautiful people like Miss Mary Lynn, who didn't see him as a broken foster kid, but saw him as a child of the king. People say it takes a village to raise a child, and I don't know much about villages, but I do know something about churches. And I can tell you, friends, this church is special. This church helped us raise our foster son with us. On his last Sunday while he was living with us, before moving to independent living as an 18-year-old, he walked the halls of this church. And 10 people from this church stopped him to pray with him, to speak life into him, to give him prophetic words, to encourage him. And he just bawled the whole time during both services. And on the day he chose to move out, after we loaded his truck, he gave me a hug. And then he hugged Angela. And he said, I'm sorry for everything. And it was the first time he actually ever initiated a hug towards me. Don't you tell me God can't change a heart. Don't you tell me his love is not powerful to transform us from the inside out. And perhaps that was one of the hardest parts of fostering him was actually letting him go. I know for a fact that God the Father never wants to let any of his children go. Being a foster parent was something that will forever mark me and Angela. And yes, it was challenging. In fact, I would say it was the third hardest thing I've done in my life. The second hardest thing, again, I talked about last summer. There's two YouTube videos you can watch. But the question to ask was not, was it difficult? The question to ask is, was it worth it? And our answer is a resounding yes. It is also worth mentioning that not every foster care situation looks like this. There's many different scenarios and outcomes. But to be clear, I'm also not asking you all to go become foster parents. That is a calling and it's the Lord's responsibility to call you. What I am inviting you to do is love like the Father because that is the only chance we have to love people well. We have clear direction from God's word about how to love and serve others. And here are three lessons we learned. The first is love like Jesus. In John 15, verse 12, it says, this is my commandment that you love one another as I have loved you. The idea was not that Angela and I would love him to the best of our ability. It was actually that we would love him to the best of Jesus's ability. In our foster journey, this truth was brought to light time and again. There were so many times I thought we were done, and yet the Holy Spirit would show up to give us a new strategy, a new insight, a new direction or approach we could engage him with. And then we found a way to love beyond our limits and love like Jesus, as we had originally committed to. And that doesn't mean we even did that well every day, to be perfectly honest but we were clear on what the goal was and that is what we continued to do. Number two, wash feet. In the very next verse in John 15, that's verse 13, it says, greater love has no one than this, that someone laid down his life for his friends. I believe the greatest expression of love is service, is sacrifice of self, in the interest of others. We tend to think that sharing Jesus with people is about what we say, but I actually believe it's more about how we live. Serving someone in love is a surefire way to soften even the hardest hearts. If you wanna disciple someone, serve them. I promise you, it will work and you'll get that invitation. And could this be why Jesus lived with his disciples for three years? For three years, they got to hear his teachings. They got to see his love in action. And ultimately, they got to be served by him and serve with him. If 
you have your Bibles, you can turn to John chapter 13. And we're getting towards the end of Jesus' life before the crucifixion. And an intimate moment with his disciples, Jesus goes low because he is the servant of all and puts a towel around his waist and begins to wash the feet of the disciples. Let's pick it up in the second half of John 13, verse one. It reads, he had loved his disciples during his ministry on earth and now he loved them to the very end. Man, I aspire to have a love like Jesus where I can love people to the very end. A love that is faithful, trustworthy, and true. And I wonder, have you let the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords wash your feet? John chapter 13, verse 14 says, and since I, your Lord and teacher, have washed your feet, you ought to wash each other's feet. Jesus is not washing random feet, friends. He is washing your feet. He is washing my feet. He is washing the feet of the disciples. Do you see the, the king of glory step down from heaven and take off those robes to put on this towel, to get low and maybe see you eye to eye as your face is against a mattress? Do you hear him invite you to stay? Will you let him cleanse you of all unrighteousness? I think God has put people in all of our lives that he is inviting us to consider how we can wash their feet, how we can serve them. And for Angela and I in that season, it was our foster son. Point number three, care for the least of these. Please turn to Matthew 25, verses 31 to 40. It says, but when the son of man comes in his glory and all the angels with him, then he will sit upon his glorious throne. All the nations will be gathered in his presence and he will separate the people as a shepherd separates the sheep from the goats. He will place the sheep at his right hand and the goats at his left. Then the king will say to those on his right, Come, you who are blessed by my Father, inherit the kingdom prepared for you from the creation of the world. For I was hungry and you fed me. I was thirsty and you gave me a drink. I was a stranger and you invited me into your home. I was naked and you gave me clothing. I was sick and you cared for me. I was in prison and you visited me. Then these righteous ones will reply, Lord, when did we ever see you hungry and feed you? or thirsty and give you something to drink, or a stranger and show you hospitality, or naked and give you clothing? When did we ever see you sick or in prison and visit you? And the king will say, I tell you the truth. When you did it to one of the least of these, my brothers and sisters, you were doing it to me. What are you willing to do for the least of these? for the most vulnerable in our community. What is interesting about this list of people that Jesus mentions, the hungry, thirsty, stranger, naked, sick, and imprisoned, is that it actually describes those who are in foster care or have been in foster care. Did you know three out of four people who are incarcerated spent time in foster care? Half of those who are homeless out on the streets spend time in the foster care system. 60% of child sex trafficking victims were in foster care. You see, foster care is this strange thread that is woven throughout our social issues and ills. And I'm gonna say, if you care about homelessness, if you care about crime and incarceration, if you care about mental health, if you care about 
human trafficking than care about foster care because it's a funnel for so many of these things. And I didn't know that. And I was ignorant. And people say ignorance is bliss, but I actually think it's blindness. As a person and as a pastor, I did not know. Because no one around me was talking about it. But now I can't unknow what I know. And I am responsible for what I know. Listen to this. 50% of the children in foster care across the country come from 5% of the counties. And Sedgwick County is one of them. There are 1,400 kids in the foster care system in Sedgwick County. And out of that 1,400, a hundred of them are specifically within the zip code of this church. Friends, the government makes a terrible parent. This is not the government responsibility, it's ours. In James chapter 127, it says, pure and genuine religion in the sight of God the Father means caring for orphans and widows in their distress and refusing to let the world corrupt you. The government is not in charge of pure and genuine religion in sight of God the Father. That's the church's responsibility. I'm gonna get really real with y'all because that's my specialty. The government steps into things where the church steps out of them. The church needs to get back into stepping into things. That's our invitation and that's our opportunity. Again, I'm not saying everyone should be a foster parent, but rather that everyone can do something. That's the idea of being an activated church. Not that we would all do the same things. We're one body but many different parts and together we move as a body. I'd say who better to recognize, who better to help than those who understand the idea of sonship and daughtership, the idea of adoption because we've been engrafted, we've been ingrained into Christ. What I realized through fostering him was not that it was actually about fostering him. It was about fostering hope in him. It was about fostering faith in him. It was about fostering truth and identity and a future in him. And that's where I think you guys are well equipped and well able to help them. And now while foster care is connected to so many social issues, I was actually surprised to find that there is one more way we can move upstream, that foster care actually is a symptom of something greater. And that's unhealth. The one unifying characteristic, the common denominator of every single family that enters a foster care system is that they're unhealthy and their unhealth bubbles over into crisis. And when crisis happens, that's when the neighbors are calling people like Howie to show up to take this family into government care. But what if the church cared more? The best foster care story we will ever tell, the best story of how we can care for foster children as a church is that we would intervene before the government needed to. It's prevention before intervention would be the idea. And only if churches around the world would consider their opportunity to lead people to health. See, Wichita 100 is not a foster care movement. It's actually much broader than just foster care. Wichita 100 is a movement about activation about us partnering with God to release the Father's heart and his love in our community. Foster care is just one way we can do that, but loving our families, helping them be healthy, well, that's just pastoring and shepherding. 
I think that's our specialty. We should be really good at that. And I'm proud to say that New Life is involved with a movement of local churches, that we are partnering with other churches and resources and nonprofits, and we're linking arms to be able to better support our New Life families and the community as a whole. And in fact, at last month's Wichita Prayer Breakfast, we launched this movement called Care for Every Family. And I'd like to show a video that you could see of what God is doing outside these walls. Jesus himself said, what is impossible to man is possible with God. It is his will that the church step up to the plate and bring them out. If we can do it in Possible Trot, you can do it here. We are gathered to be about the action. Scream as loud as you can, the action. Yes. In order for God to work out a miracle, there has to be a problem. Foster care, we're up more than 30% in the last decade. So that's kind of a problem. But for people that are charged by God, we take on the opportunity to be the solution. What's needed is ignition in a way that Jesus really intended, a coalition of the willing to do something crazy radical to end the foster crisis in Wichita, around the country, because when that happens, there will be a great shaking. I hope you guys understand that we are at the nexus of something very beautiful. It is very rare and unique that you get to be at the birth of a movement. And when we're talking about caring for every family, I believe what happens in Wichita will change the world. As someone who grew up in the foster care system, I'm so used to a lot of people that have not actually been in the system telling my stories for me. I mean, it was beautiful, it was very emotional. The bishop was right in front of me and I just, I felt that power, that impact that he had, and I know we can do that in Wichita. Amazing. Um, it, I had a roller coaster of emotion. It was beautiful. It was a beautiful story. Let's get in there and support them in the ways that each one of us are called to do that. As mayor, I want our city to flourish. I envision Wichita as a model city where children and families thrive. We see a community where our children are cared for by families, where parents are empowered with tools and the necessary relationships that they need to be the best families they can be. Our job is to nurture, protect God, and be positive examples for our children. We got so many children now in the system Somebody has to say, I'm breaking this cycle. And that's where you empower them with the tools, the skills, the coaching, the counseling that helps them break the cycle because if they break it, they break it for their family. And we have so many churches that have gone to sleep. We was called to take care of the widows and the orphanage. We should be able to work together and encouraging this effort to work together with other churches, white churches, brown churches, black churches, strategize together and work with these systems to be able to, to eliminate this. It's time not church for us to wake up. It's time not for the church to reach way down and pick those up that don't know a way out, that never had a way out. I'm crazy enough to believe that he said, church, you got the power to overcome all things. I'm crazy enough to believe it don't matter where you at. In Possum Trot, Halifax, Mushu, it don't matter in Wichita, you got the power. When a community comes together for their most vulnerable children, we can change a country. The country can look to this community as the example of how a community turns inward and solves our most prevailing crisis with our children. This is much bigger than any one church. This is churches mobilized together to express the Father's love. Wichita 100 has long been underway through the many different ministries of this church, our benevolence ministries, meals for the homeless, the educator collaboration, embrace grace, and so on. 
And I'd love for you all to get involved to whatever extent the Lord is compelling you and inviting you in. This Wednesday, we do have an informational meeting for Wichita 100 that Pastor Tim and I will have the honor and privilege of leading out with you guys. It's at 6.30 in the multi-purpose room. Next, this movie, the Possum Trap movie they were talking about actually is called The Sound of Hope from Angel Studios, which is the same studio that produced The Sound of Freedom. And this is gonna be released July 4th. And I would ask that you make plans to go watch it. And in fact, we've bought a block of tickets that we're going to have some special showings. If you can't afford it or whatever, come with us and let's watch it together and see what Bishop Martin was able to do in his own community through his churches, yes. And lastly, I would ask that you pray for what God is doing throughout this city. Pray for our government officials as the word instructs us to do. Pray for those who are in the foster care system and impacted by it. Pray for this church and our leadership. We do not wanna get ahead of God. We wanna be in lockstep with what God is doing and we don't want to move without him. Loving God will compel us to live differently so we can love differently. When we choose to love the least of these, we're not only loving them, but we are loving Jesus. We have an incredible opportunity to love those within the walls of this church, within the walls of our home and within our community. I firmly believe that love will save the world because it has to, because it is the only thing that can. Let's pray. Lord, I thank you so much for this opportunity to share a little bit about Angela and I's journey into foster care. God, I repent for being ignorant, for not knowing sooner. Thank you for the opportunity to love the least of these inside and outside of the foster care system. Thank you, God, for the families within this church who call New Life home that we can come alongside, that we can support to bring health, to bring encouragement, to bring truth to them. Thank you, God, that it is always your will for us to be healthy. Thank you, God, that you are moving across this city, in this country, that you are shifting the hearts of pastors towards children towards the most vulnerable in our communities. Thank you that we can break generational curses by partnering with you. And bigger than Wichita 100, we pray for World 100, that this entire planet is impacted by the power and presence of a father who loves them and a God who is relentlessly pursuing them. May we not love people to the best of our ability. May we love them to the best of yours. Thank you, thank you, thank you. For being a good father. In Jesus' name we pray, amen.